Kipi in Saskatchewan has a strong and noble history of standing its ground since its inception in 1963. In key public sectors from health to education to civic government to libraries to legal aid workers to childcare workers to universities to community-based organizations, Kipi has led the way in building good working conditions and dignity and respect in the workplace. It has strived through its history to work in alliances and in solidarity of struggles at home and internationally. It has fought to break down the barriers that keep communities apart, and has challenged those governments that do not work in the best interests of their citizens. This is the story of QP Saskatchewan, standing our ground. Well, QP Saskatchewan, uh, I'm the treasurer, so I could give you a couple of numbers. I could look at this from a quantitative approach. Uh, the membership of QP in Saskatchewan is closing into 30,000. And QP National just surpassed the mark of 600,000. So one could say, oh, it's 5% of QP. But it's not as simple as this. The membership of QP in Saskatchewan is not 5% of QP. It's 100% of QP because of, of what they bring to the table of our national union. Uh, uh, they bring a lot. Uh, the history, but mu much more than, than the history uh, and keeping the flame, the torch up, up there, you know. Uh, it's the current commitment. Uh, being what QP is, being a, a, a community uh, union. QP regions and rest of the country always used to say, point at us. And uh, I know the national office always pointed at QP Saskatchewan, a small, a small province, but was always first in a lot of the, a lot of the programs we were doing. It, it always felt like people in Saskatchewan were able to be active regionally and locally and nationally at the same time. There was something it's, it's like they got it. They got that activism had to happen on all levels and they got the reasons for being part of the National Union. In the 1960s, QP in Saskatchewan had major growth in organizing and representation in the health sector. Under the leadership of Gordon Kowali and others, it won important bargaining rights for hospital workers. When I uh, started working for Victoria Union Hospital in 19, 1960, I guess, yeah, early 1960. At that time, there was no QP. We, we belonged to a union called NUPSI. And uh, QP came about in 19... There was a, a new merger between NUPSI and NUPI in 1963. Uh, the healthcare workers were the, probably the lowest paid workers in Saskatchewan. We had uh, no benefits, you know, the very low wages and that type of situation. And, uh, and the 60s were very difficult. In fact, a kind of reminiscence where we are today, where people were threatened, where people... Uh, we're afraid to, to take action, and uh, and when the, when 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 the employer said no, well, people just accepted it. That fact. But uh, one of the major differences we had is uh, is the, the differences in salaries from hospital from hospital to hospital, small hospital, big hospitals, and uh, the first uh, merger uh, ended up in standardizing all the all the collective uh, all the, the salaries at that time. Gordon. Uh, well, uh, the, the union was a seven day, 365 days a year job. I remember the first time when I come on staff and I told him I bought season tickets for the Blades and the first thing he asked me is when you're going to go. One of the things he always pushed very hard on was the social issues, uh, uh, the women's rights. Back in those days, we didn't have as many locals, but they were all farther apart. And so the average driving in a year was 100,000 100, miles not kilometers, but miles. In the 1970s, QP Saskatchewan grew to include more workers in more sectors. Legal aid, daycare workers, university employees, education workers, teaching assistants, library workers all became part of the QP Saskatchewan family. I was 23 and I was looking for a job and uh, a girlfriend of a friend said they were hiring at the university in the library, so I went out and applied, got a job there. Um, and really quickly got involved in the union. It was just, it was part of the culture there. It was like, you know, once a month there'd be a meeting and everybody in the library would go to the union meeting. It was a, a monthly meeting for the whole membership, but everyone would go to the library meetings. Um, it was just something you did. Um, and I'd been working there for several months and the shop steward had moved to a new job, so he wanted to step back. And I was really interested in it, but I was scared to put my name forward. And a woman who I really respected there said, you want to be a shop steward? And I said, yeah. <laughs> At that time, people still um, uh, didn't have maternity leave or it was really short maternity leaves uh, or you had to quit or, you know, like so many things. I mean, you look back to what we have now. 
I mean, I can remember when I started working, you got $200 a month. Like, that was it. Um, you know, got $10 a day as a TA. Started organizing probably in about 19, in the fall of 1977. And so we would, and we organized, uh, we continued organizing for probably about a year. Um, because Kibi wasn't sure just how many employees we had working for the school board. It was really hard to get a number. And of course, none of us knew either. So they were really being careful about how many, uh, you know, when we went to the LRB. So um, it was slow progress, but eventually we got certified. I think it was uh, in 78, I believe. I had never done it ever before. I'm not even sure I particularly trusted unions at that time. I probably, one of my reasons for getting involved is, is that I wasn't quite sure of them. So I figured, well, I might as well get involved and then I could keep an eye on them. But in the 70s, people, that was the fun years. You know, uh, we made great advances in, in salaries and benefits and pensions, and because we had no pensions in those days either, prior to that. You know, uh, I can remember one day, one time, uh, I was bargaining for Local 600 and we got a two-year agreement with 12 and 13%, plus we got adjustments that, uh, that, that gave uh, adjustments up to 20%. And I remember I went to the Health Council conference and they come to me and they called me a traitor because I'd, I'd, I'd settled for too low, 12 and 13 percent. Trudeau had run against wage control, saying they would only freeze wages, they would do nothing about prices, and then did a quite quick about face and imposed them. So people were just furious. I mean, everyone knew it was a sham, everyone knew it was an attack on organized labor. It was basically the driving forces in that were, were QP and, and RWDSU. They were really pushing the Federation of Labor to do something and to do it quickly, to bring pressure to bear on the government not to, not to get into the wage controls program. The other thing that was pushing that very hard was the hospital workers were in negotiations, and I think they had offers on the table which were in excess of the guidelines. So they, had, they knew exactly, you know what, you could do the arithmetic really quickly what was at stake. And that was, even then, the, the bulk of QP's members and probably the most orga well organized and most, and most uh, militant and, and among the ones that were sort of right on the cutting edge with provincial government because that's a huge chunk of the provincial budget went. So it was really a driving issue for, for QP. And, uh, and people went out and mobilized really hard. It was a very direct grassroots. It wasn't just a call saying we're going to have a general strike. It was We went around the workplace and said there's going to be a general strike February 2nd. It's really cold. And what I remember was getting there because we were here from Regina and it was a, you know, a sizable crowd, but it didn't look like, you know, it didn't look like the workers uprising. It didn't look like a lot. And then I remember someone said, the hospital workers are here and these buses start rolling in bus after bus after bus. Mm -hmm. I remember us getting onto buses and coming down to the legislature. Um, and I even remember um, people hanging him in effigy and, and uh, all of those kinds of, those kinds of things. Because, I mean, you know, if there was demonstrations, we just, all, everybody went, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. We could never do that today. In 1982, the hospital rotating strike showed a determination to not back down to NDP government threats of back-to-work orders. There was a clear dividing line on the rights of workers versus political allegiance. I was the, head, the editor of the CUPE News, which was basically just reporting on what the locals were doing and so on in Saskatchewan. And of course at that time there was uh, uh, developed a kind of a split in, in, in CUPE between the people who were vigorously supportive of the NDP regardless of what they were doing, even if they weren't doing what they should have been doing in, in labor issues, and the other people more on the left who, who would oppose uh, and uh, I think that the split sort of developed when the healthcare workers went on strike and uh, they were ordered back to work by the NDP. But what really set it off was the nurses made a huge catch up in their bargaining and the two agreements were negotiated the same weekend. Um, keeping one was, was much less eh, sort of general public sector guideline at that point. There didn't seem to be a fight in people. But the nurses had gone way beyond that. Well, nobody knew that when that contract was signed. But that week, the reports from the bargaining committee hit all the hospitals simultaneously. The, the nurses won and the QP won, right? So there's just an immediate difference in terms of the rates. But there were also other things like differential, shift differential jumps for the nurses and it's pretty puny for QP. So it's just huge anger. The, that was a strike that went out and, uh, 
and become a political strike because uh, uh, the NDP was in power and uh, I suppose we always believed at that time or prior to that that they were our friends and we learned a bitter lesson I suppose we learned a lesson when whoever's in power whether it's and I always said whether it's a blue knife or a red knife or an orange knife or they slit your throat the results are still the same between the public and private sector unions uh, back in, in that period of time uh, it created some some bad feelings uh, I think one of the things we, we were we were in Cube is we were trade unionists and we were and we were uh, a union with a social conscience and uh, we, we always believed that uh, the trade union aspect come first and and we, we were uh, NDP supporters but when the, the gloves were thrown down we treated them as any other employer. The subsequent divine years brought more toil and struggle but again QP Saskatchewan played a key role in mobilization of unions and communities together to fight the violence cronies. Through organizations such as the Provincial Social Justice Coalition, many people were mobilized resulting in massive demonstrations at the Provincial Legislative Building. At that time we thought Thatcher was the worst person we could ever come across. He, he brought in legislation that uh, took our rights away to strike and he was, he was a bully. But under uh, the Divine Regime, I think we found uh, a government that, that, that had no conscience whatsoever. Now, the real feeling of fighting back against Divine. Um, people got really fed up. So there, was this, there were lots of fights going on all over the place, around the crowns. There was so much stuff. Children's dental plan, the drug plan, all kinds of bitter things. You know, the anger just kept growing, sort of dispersing of people. <laughs> sort of. Grant Divine is Paul Potts sending people out to the countryside, right? They're gonna, they're gonna break up the government agencies and relocate them all. And it was just, that was almost, seemed to be almost a groundswell, you know, that people were just so fed up. So when the election finally came, they were just swept, you know, swept out of power. Well, it was fun in a way because, uh, oddly enough, as I say, when you, get, when you get in a government in there that you can really dislike and oppose, that, that it really unites the labor movement together and, and other, uh, you know, pro-left groups, if you want to call them that. Yes, and uh, the, uh, uh, the one they had at the legislature, I forget how, it was about 7,000 people that came out. And I remember Divine making the comment that they only came for the hot dogs or something because we were serving hot dogs, which was kind of a humorous thing to say. In QP, we had a real rank and uh, opposition rank and file caucus, and uh, it was uh, people like Gil Levine and Larry Katz and John Calvert who, uh, you know, were in the research department and, and doing excellent work, uh, were making connections right across Canada. And uh, Saskatchewan seems to be the hotbed for most people uh, when it comes to the political left. Mm -hmm. Gil, uh, Gil was just such a special person. Um, he was a real mentor. He, I mean, you know, if you wanted to talk to somebody, you could phone uh, Gil and he would explain things to you and help teach you and bring you along. And uh, he, he just really meant a lot to a lot of people. And uh, for us in Saskatchewan, um, he, he was our only link to the national for a lot of years. Mm -hmm. I mean, we never would have had um, a percentage due structure in CUPE without the left. I mean, that was that's how they got it, is, is by the Left Wing Caucus. CUPE Saskatchewan continued its strong involvement in international labour solidarity, playing a key role in the worldwide struggle against apartheid and support for liberation movements in Central America. We don't just exist in one small part of the world, that we are part of a larger world, and I think that's one of the things that I thought about. Uh, CUPE was very uh, important in that respect because CUPE's always been more than simply a company union or you know representing only their own workers that they've also uh, tried to broaden into international uh, affairs. You know back in the 80s I think that there was a lot of people who said you know well we've got to take care of our problems here first before we do anything and we would argue otherwise and you know apartheid is a blight that has to be eliminated but we also worked on Central American solidarity work and so on and our basic premise was uh, you know when they win we win. I think we were probably the first union to get involved in international politics. We joined forces with uh, one of the, the major public sector union in, in Africa. And QP uh, uh, still internationally has that association with uh, Africa. In the Roman years of the 1990s, QP had to deal with the aftermath of Divine and the cupboard being bare. 
That did not stop major struggles for better working conditions and pay equity. The Romano years, well, I mean, there was a real sense of optimism. There was a real, um, uh, you know, I mean, they were gone, right? I mean, the vine was gone. It was, and all of that stuff was discredited. And we had some friends and we had people we knew who were in, you know, in the legislature. And then really quickly, you know, we got, you know, the news started to come out about the, what terrible shape the finances were in. And they had huge things on their plates, but we were back to being, you know, uh, junior partners again. In a way, it was a very tough time uh, for people in the labor movement, federally, uh, with uh, some very deep cutbacks in the form of the, the 1995 federal budget that Paul Martin brought down and the implementation of block funding and, and, and cuts, cutbacks within that block funding with the Canada Health and Social Transfers. On the provincial front, uh, we're dealing with an NDP government that was quite fixated with uh, deficit reduction and, uh, you know, trying to uh, trying to get them to expand uh, social programs and 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 to reverse the cuts that were made by the the Grant Divine Conservatives. QP Saskatchewan during during that time period was was one of fighting kind of rear guard actions in a way fighting defensive battles and also kind of fighting unsuccessfully to to get the provincial government to to move forward on on labor legislation. Personally, I've learned some good lessons over the years politically. Again, uh, careful who you yell at. Uh, we had a, a fairly progressive government. Some would argue maybe could have been more progressive under the New Democratic Party. I recall one convention was actually Saskatchewan Federation of uh, Labor Convention where we weren't too keen on what the government had done and as a result marched them out of the hall, uh, Premier Roy Romano and his entire cabinet. And in hindsight that may have been a mistake because the door pretty much closed on us. In 1994, workers in Saskatoon built a common front among civic, library, transport and power workers fighting together for a decent settlement, showing the power of worker-to-worker -worker alliances. In 1999, um, QP Saskatchewan was very involved with the fight uh, fight back against the multilateral agreement on investment, which was a, you know, basically a corporate rights treaty and it would promote investment, uh, investment, new investment rules over, you know, the, the interests of, of, of the public and social programs. And uh, there was wide ranging um, impacts that that, that deal um, could have had on, on public sector on, on the public sector and public sector workers. We were part of a kind of a global movement uh, against against MEI and, and you know we, we kind of did our small part in Saskatchewan to help uh, to help uh, stop that that agreement. Um, so I think you, that was a really big success story for QP Saskatchewan because uh, I think in, as far as the labor movement went, I think, I think QP was, was on the forefront of that battle. Started in 1979 at the city of Saskatoon. I was hired on in the sign shop there and I knew it was a union. I union shop. I'd worked for in union shops before. I was a little disappointed. I No one seemed to know which union it was. I asked around, found out it was QP. Went to a few union meetings and uh, long story short, I ended up running for shop steward. Uh, ran for vice president and ultimately president. Uh, during that time I got, took an interest on the, at the provincial level and attended a few conventions, got on as a committee, was quite frankly encouraged to become vice president. Uh, on a sad note, quite a sad note, I was quite happy being the vice president but our president of the day, Brother Glenn McAhonick, passed away quite suddenly. Uh, leaving that position vacant and uh, very unfortunately and I ran for that and was successful and uh, and have remained in the position until today. Sure, I think when Glenn died was one of the toughest times for me. I didn't feel prepared. Uh, I was being encouraged again to run. There was another candidate. But Glenn had some very good leadership qualities and really strong ideals. Something uh, He was a man I always looked up to and uh, still think about him on a regular day. What, what would he have done in this situation? So Glenn was very smart and he was a really good politician. Uh, you know, in terms of being the president of the division, he was really, really good. 
uh, and you could count on him for every strike. I mean, and he, and he knew history so well. He knew CUPE history and uh, labor history, and he was uh, good at teaching it. And uh, he was, uh, I don't know, he just was a, a, a really good person. In 1997, the Dorsey Report led to a major restructuring of representation in the healthcare sector. CUPE Saskatchewan lost some very loyal and active members. But the unions involved were able to pull together a health care council to represent all workers. Then we, of course, went through Dorsey where they combined everybody and uh, we had to put together one agreement out of six or eight of us. Uh, you know, it's, everybody's got different seniority and vacations and hours of work. And some of our, our, our member, our, our health, our hospitals that we lost were, 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 were original CUPE member, CUPE hospitals. So we lost some very good friends that, that worked with us for years and years and years. And sometimes they felt we'd betrayed them. Betrayed them because we couldn't keep them in CUPE. Well, but we just couldn't, that was just the way it was. The last decade saw the fight for the rights of workers in rural Saskatchewan school board workers in Modena and Bigger, health care workers in Ituna. These were long struggles, but they showed the power of the union in standing together. The strike I was involved in in 1994 at the city of Saskatoon, where 2,200 city workers uh, took to the streets and we stayed out there for two months. Down here in Regina, there was a significant municipal strike as well. It lasted, uh, I believe, just over a month. Uh, there's been smaller strikes that were very significant, I think. Some sisters and a, and a couple of brothers in a group home in Regina, Cheshire Homes, Local 3207, walked for, I believe, it was about two months again. It was quite an extensive strike in Bigger Saskatchewan, the education sector, another one in Wadena, the education sector. And these were turning points for the members involved, certainly. But it sends a message to employers that you push people far enough and they will say, hold everything on, you know. We're going to stop working until we can come to a reasonable uh, deal here. So people don't like the word strike, but in fact, it is simply people in a democracy saying, hold it, let's stop everything and have a discussion here. Or, and until we do, we're not going to work. The attempt to close down libraries in Regina provoked an incredible outcry and resistance from QP and community groups that resulted in a community mobilization that stopped the closures. Uh, the Friends of the Regina Public Library was the umbrella group and they were able to gather over 26,000 signatures opposed to the closures and uh, eventually uh, the, the Regina Public Library Board collapsed and uh, the, 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 cut, the closures, the cuts were, were stopped. So that was, that was a really uh, successful example of how CUPE can work very effectively with uh, with allies in, in the community. Pay equity became embedded in all major struggles for better working conditions, and the bottom line has been rising. However, educational systems who play a key part in the education system have been under attack. Women have come to play a recognized role in the running of the union, both locally and at the division level, and women have become prominent in staff roles. A general rise in consciousness has taken place that brings in marginalized groups, uh, our membership has been quite a bit higher uh, proportion-wise for women than a national average. All the equity issues, I should say, not just women, it's all the equity issues remain high on the priority because they seem to be taking a back seat. Something that I think none of us had expected uh, but happened in this last decade is for the first time in the history of our school support workers, these are people that work in K-12 education as caretakers, secretaries, teacher aides. Um, we saw them go out on strike. In each of these strikes, it was virtually all women, uh, with just a few men. And just tr tremendous uh, courage, real gutsiness, and they hung together and uh, showed tremendous solidarity. And CUPE really rallied. CUPE, as a union here in Saskatchewan, realized the importance of these strikes and um, the staff was there, the, the other elected members were there, locals were there. It was, it was really inspiring. Probably a decade ago, maybe a, bit, maybe a bit longer, it was pretty difficult to get to a microphone to speak to a resolution that was dealing with an equity issue. Um, as, I mean, some equity issues are easier to deal with than others because uh, for sure, the word racism has been around uh, longer than homophobia, for example. 
at last year's uh, QPSAS convention, it was really a time when I, I felt proud to stand at the microphone and say, you know, we have come a long ways from what I first experienced in QP, and I can now comfortably bring my partner to our social events and, and not be ridiculed. And I know that the delegates at last convention were, were deeply moved by hearing about their growth and how, how far they've come along in terms of being accepting. A big highlight for me was working under Sister Judy Darcy, the national president. Judy really was a dynamic leader. My understanding of the demographics of Canada is that will be our future as new Canadians, immigrant people, not uh, our birth rate is far too low. Uh, we've heard this from many sources and we need to start in embracing that too. And it's an education thing. A strong recognition has been made of the role of youth for the present and the future. People talk about young people being involved in the union. I was 23 on a job, Stuart, 24 when I was co-chair of the strike committee, 26 when I was president of the local, almost 30 when I went to work for QP, 32 on the hospital strike. And in those years, it, it didn't matter that you were young, right? If you wanted to work, there was no boundaries. So I don't know what happened to us, right, as we moved through there as boomers, that it became hard for young people to break in. But young people were the, you know, had this, this energy, right? Um, I got smarter, you know, the longer I was there. But that energy, that commitment, that drive, like, nobody's got that like a 20 or 30 year old. Building on years of bringing Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities together, Keep the Saskatchewan played a fundamental role in the formation of the National Aboriginal Rights Council. And I also knew over the years that uh, as the Aboriginal uh, society uh, and, and their populations expanded, that they were going to become a major part of the workforce. And uh, also I knew that, that they were never encouraged, the Aboriginal people were never encouraged to be active in unions. Their leadership was, most of their leadership was anti-union. And I think there was anti-union because they didn't understand unions. They didn't know unions. All they were to do, they were afraid of union. Under my watch as regional director, I was fortunate to have Don Moran uh, who, as one of our representatives who had some very good contacts in the, in the Métis Society. A couple of years ago, we finally got uh, our council, the Aboriginal Council. I've done a lot of work in the last few years trying to do things with the Aboriginal people, trying to get them more involved and uh, work closely with Don Moran, uh, and, um, because they're, they're going to be our future. The election of Wallace Saskatchewan Party government has resulted in anti-labour and essential services legislation that undermines the right to strike and is aimed directly at the Healthcare Workers Coalition. Probably the next one was the Saskatchewan Party government taking power. It changed the whole landscape for us. Uh, we can't get in to talk to them. They never consult with us. They do things that, in our view, is going to be very, very harmful to our members and to this province as a whole. So Bills 5 and 6, the Essential Services Act and the amendments to the Trade Union Act are probably the worst pieces of legislation that uh, working people have seen in this province certainly in my lifetime. The Essential Services Act is uh, designed to take away collective bargaining rights from public sector workers and the changes to the Trade Union Act is really designed to make it very, very difficult for uh, workers, other workers, to join unions. Like right now, it seems like um, we've never been in such a fight as we've been in in this, this, last, this last term. And Divine, uh, I think back to Divine, and he seems awful, awfully easy almost compared to what Wall is. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's just because of the legislation. The Welfare Rights Centre is a, is a community-based organization that has been around for over 35 years. And, and they help uh, people, uh, vulnerable people, on social assistance. A couple of years ago, they, the they got a new executive director and there was quite a turnover with the, the uh, members on the board and uh, the new manage management started talking about firing employees without cause and so not surprisingly the employees of the Welfare Rights Centre uh, approached QP to, uh, to see about, to look into unionizing Things came to a head um, in late June of 2010 when the local president and the secretary-treasurer 
were first suspended and then were terminated. We ended up filing an unfair labor practice shortly after that. Finally, when we got it, a date, we bargained for half a day and then uh, the talks broke off and we were, we were informed the following week that the Ministry of Social Services was cutting all of the funding to the Welfare Rights Centre. They provide 100% of the, the funding for the centre. This case kind of shows you what unions are really all about because uh, these, these employees did not come to QP because they wanted a big wage increase. They, want, they came to QP because they were concerned about their job security and they wanted some respect in the workplace. We've been pretty successful, I believe, in uh, resisting privatization in this province. It's a curse that most people in, in the Western world face nowadays where public services have been handed over to the uh, private sector. But we've had some successes here. CUP has been a leader in preventing uh, the P3, the uh, public-private partnership, although that keeps rearing its ugly head over and over again. During the, the, the crisis with the, the, the water crisis in North Battleford, a private company, U.S. Filter, out of nowhere came and, and, and made a proposal to the city of North Battleford to do a, a P3, public-private partnership, for a new sewage treatment plant. So we worked with the, the local there and, um, and they did a presentation, so I helped them develop a brief that, that was presented to City Council and that option died. We've never really shied away from standing up for ourselves. Militancy is something we, we think is part of our union movement. I actually was quite flattered by a uh, local talk show host, uh, John Gormley, some may be familiar with him, when he called CUPE the most militant union in the province. I, I thought that was a real uh, feather in our cap. And it's not that we're tipping over buses and smashing windows, etc., but we do, in fact, have members that will stand up and say, enough is enough. Throughout these struggles, CUPE and Saskatchewan promoted and carried out community unionism where union and community stand together and support each other for social and economic justice. When people do well in society, the whole society will do well. If you have people in poverty, you have people who can't get basic services, it's a recipe for trouble. Like uh, we, we prefer to refer to ourselves as the community union, uh, and as with most unions, the workers are part of the community. As far as becoming active in the community. We certainly don't shy away from any kind of community projects that come our way. Station 20 West is a great example of that. We were able to uh, give some support financially. Community unionism to me is, is that's what we're about. I mean because uh, you know I think of the municipal workers as, over the last couple of years uh, we've been fighting to keep the community rinks open. Mm -hmm. There's a good example. QP in Saskatchewan, although one of the smallest divisions of QP in Canada, has stood its ground. It has had a profound impact on the national agenda for social and economic change, pioneering major initiatives that have been adopted by all of QP across Canada. The strength of QP in Saskatchewan will be fundamental in resisting the continued assaults by right-wing governments and corporate media on working people, the poor, and the disenfranchised. But I think we made some major gains, but uh, you know, in the trade union movement, gains have never been quick. Most of the time it took a period of time, a long period of time, as the, as the history of unions go on. And as uh, long as people continue and don't give up, it will succeed. Well, I don't know that there's any magic bullet. It's simply a question of organizing and uh, getting people more interested in trade union matters. I've always been a proponent of, of trying to get uh, education, trade union education in the schools and the universities and certainly if, if young people knew more about what unions not only did but what they can do for them and when they go out to become a worker recognize that unions uh, you know can certainly help them out. It's the little things that matter in my mind. It's, it's the strike that went well and the workforce uh, that got its collective agreement. It's um, seeing a young worker take some leadership uh, roles. It's seeing Aboriginal people coming together. I, and I know it's hard for people now. I mean, in these you know, right-wing governments, and I've been, you know, I see people um, sitting in a couple of arbitration but It's just, just ugly, some ways much uglier than stuff where they look even divine, right? Um, but 
that passes. That's not the trend of humanity. Things go back sometimes, right? There's backsliding. There's uh, this regression. Things get worse sometimes before they get better. But they get better. Uh, they don't get better by themselves. They get better because there's this huge desire for social justice in people. And now we'll come to the fore again. So we just got to keep pushing. Aware that being paid in